Welcome to my new video series on photogrammetry. Um, now, this is a method that I had not covered in previous videos because I, quite frankly, had tried it once, did not have a lot of success, and sort of just gave up on it. Um, but I've recently rediscovered it as a, a really great way, actually, to do 3D scanning and 3D capture. Um, thanks to some really great recommendations from my colleague at New Mexico or University of New Mexico, um, Jonathan Keller, and the Vertebrate Paleontology Collections Manager at University of Michigan, um, Adam Roundtree. So a big thank you to both of them. Um, and specifically, the sort of setup I'll get into later is based off of what Adam Roundtree showed me they use at University of Michigan. Um, but just to start with for today, I'm going to be going into my the background research I've been able to do um, and give you sort of a non-technical introduction to how photogrammetry actually works, because understanding how it works will help you uh, approach it a lot better and see more success. Um, if you're interested in more technical videos, there are plenty of uh, videos about that available. I'll try and link to some. But this is really just going to be the basics you need to know if this is a technique you want to apply. I also keep in mind, this is all based off of my own sort of preliminary research as I'm getting to know this technique. So um, feel free to give me any corrections uh, that, that you see and, and look at other resources as well. So for a long time, I viewed photogrammetry as basically this sort of magic method where you take a bunch of pictures and then somehow that spits out a 3D model. And you can see an example here where I took pictures of this Diabloceratops cast and then managed to get a 3D model out of it. The first time though I tried photogrammetry, I took a bunch of pictures and I got nothing out of it. So uh, what? how does photogrammetry actually work and what do we need to think about in order to take pictures that can actually output a model? So the first principle photogrammetry works on is color matching. Um, with each photograph, you've got a grid of pixels, and each of those pixels has a color value and an intensity value. Um, and the algorithms that do photogrammetry basically have ways of seeing which colors occur next to each other. So I've just got some examples of points marked on here that the program might be able to match up, like the edge of the infratemporal fenestra, sort of the, the point of the rostral bone here, and then the tip of the horn up here. And the program is really only looking at color differences, not, not specific features. So the fact that there is a darker brown next to this lighter tan right here. Um, and fortunately, this actually makes fossils really great candidates for photogrammetry because um, oftentimes there are so many little color variations that these programs really can pick up on. The second principle that photogrammetry works based on is parallax. Now, this is a concept you probably have some sort of intuitive familiarity with, even if you don't know the name. And it's basically um, how our eyes actually manage to see in 3D. So parallax is the phenomenon where things that are closer will sort of move more and uh, sort of change shape on your eye more than things that are farther away. So if I'm looking at my hand right up close, um, if I close one eye then the other, its position on my eye actually seems to change and it's really my brain stitching those together into a 3D image. Whereas if I look at something out in the distance and do the same thing it will barely move at all. And you can see this principle demonstrated as I move back and forth in front of my window the window frame seems to move a lot, but the building here hardly moves at all. And again, this is the parallax effect. This is giving us some information not about specific distance, but about relative distance. I know that the window frame is closer than the building outside. And this is, again, a principle that's used in these photogrammetry algorithms to uh, calculate 3D models. Um, so here I'm kind of setting this bottom bar as my pivot point as I'm moving around the model and you can see that this point on the skull is moving a lot less between the two pictures I showed before. The 
point at the end of the snout is moving a lot more and the horns are moving a lot more. It's slightly different than the straightforward parallax effect I showed before because um, in this case, I am not only moving the camera, but I am also rotating it slightly, which also has an effect. But fortunately, people who are smarter than me have written the algorithms and can account for all these things. So these are the two principles you need to think about as we move forward into looking at actually doing photogrammetry on fossils. Um, when you're thinking about what software you want to use for this, there are tons of options, especially as photogrammetry has become a, a more pow powerful method for things like visual effects, um, which <laughs> generates a lot more money than paleontology. Uh, so kind of some of the main paid software are Agisoft Metashape, which used to be known as uh, Photoscan, I believe. Um, that is the Adobe software. There's Autodesk Recap. That's the same suite that includes things like Maya. And then there's Reality Capture, which is an interesting case because it was recently bought by a large gaming company and it has made licenses for academics available for free. Um, and it turns out to be really powerful and able to compute very quickly, which is an advantage it has over the open source software. Um, I do recommend looking into the academic licenses if you are able. Um, they basically require a teacher to um, sign up for the license and then distribute it to students. So there is a bit of work in getting that. Um, on the other hand, we do have lots of open source and free options. The one I've been using is Meshroom. Multiview environment would be another example. Um, and you can search and find whole, whole other lists of these things. I'm going to be sticking with Metroom for these tutorials. Um, and then I just wanted to give you a comparison of what the pros and cons of this compared to surface scanning are. So I've already compared pros and cons of surface scanning with CT scanning in my earlier videos that you can look at. Um, the pros and cons of photogrammetry compared with CT scanning are essentially the same, so I'm not going to worry about that here. But there are enough differences with surface scanning where it's worth thinking about which method you really want to invest in. So photogrammetry pros, um, it is the absolute cheapest entry point. You literally, bare minimum, need a phone with a camera and a cloudy day outside, and you can produce a usable model. Um, now, of course, on the other end of that, if you want to get higher resolution, if you want to have a consistent setup that doesn't involve having to take fossils outside and hoping it's cloudy out, um, you start to need more equipment, and of course that can add up in cost. Um, the Compared with surface scanning, the capture is relatively quick. You're just taking pictures, but it does require a bit more human effort. Um, unless you get a very specific setup to automate the photograph taking. Or surface scanning, you tend to just sit something down and let it go. Um, one big advantage over surface scanning I've noticed is that there is basically no post-processing um, you have to do beyond chucking your photos in the program and clicking run on it. Um, you don't have to futz with manual alignment, which... I've always had issues with, with surface scans. Um, but the flip side of this is that you really don't see issues with your photos until you get to the post-processing step, with, whereas generally with surface scanning, you're sort of seeing real time the data you're producing and how they are lining up. Um, the final real benefit of photogrammetry and the reason I am moving more into it is because of the modular setup. So a surface scanner, you're buying a thing, usually several thousand dollars, if not more, and you're hoping the company will still exist so that it can service the thing you bought um, whenever it breaks down. Well, if the company goes out of the business or they're just slow to respond, you may be sitting with a useless piece of equipment for a while. Whereas with photogrammetry, because you're separately buying lights, a camera, a turntable, Anytime you have one piece of that break, you can sort of swap it out with something new. Um, and then the only other thing that the one other disadvantage of photogrammetry over surface scanning is that uh, photogrammetry does not automatically capture scale. 
So as I was showing before, you get sort of relative measurements of the thing you're looking at, but it's not getting a specific measurement like in millimeters or something like that. Um, there are, of course, workarounds to this. There's things like control points you can put in your photographs. You can simply measure scale at the end, but um, it is definitely something you want to keep in mind. So I am going to be doing next a video on how to take photographs for photogrammetry, keeping these principles in mind, and I hope you will join me for that.